The Center for Independence of the Disabled New York, or Sydney, is an independent living center, or ILC, and one of the city's oldest disability self-advocacy groups. Its roots trace back to the National Paraplegia Foundation, or NPF, which was founded in the 1940s by Robert Moss and his World War II veteran colleagues as the civilian and research counterpart to Paralyzed Veterans of America. See the DHNYC entry entitled Robert and Lucille Moss. NPF is probably best remembered for founding Paraplegia News, the first periodical aimed at people with disabilities as an independent readership and distinct consumer demographic. As the boomers came into disability activism in the 1970s, NPF drew in figures like Pat Figueroa and Carr Massey, and they, among others, reincarnated NPF into New York's first independent living center. Independent living was an idea pioneered around 1970 by Ed Roberts and other college-age activists who formed a pivotal nexus at the University of California at Berkeley. This group largely consisted of severely disabled young men and women who possessed the ambition and drive to attend a highly competitive college, live in on-campus dorms, and participate in the wild and woolly hippie era notwithstanding their physical impairments. This was a truly radical notion. Wheelchair users in those days were still frequently referred to as patients, and consistent with this language of presumed dependency, Berkeley administrators initially imposed a 10 p.m. curfew for students with disabilities. Independent living, by contrast, meant living as freely as possible and making decisions for yourself when it came to medical care, supportive services, and the other activities of life. In short, Rather than a solely individual burden, disability was a matter of individual choice and community adaptation. And to be sure, disability activism already implicitly operated from this perspective, but never before had it been stated quite so explicitly, so bluntly, or so consequentially. The first independent living center was founded at Berkeley in the early 1970s. It made quite a name for itself as a grassroots organizing and community center, and the idea quickly spread. In 1978, the Federal Rehabilitation Act was amended to add Title VII, which for the first time provided federal funding for the development of a national network of independent living centers. The transformation of NPF into Sydney came about that same year. There are presently some 33 ILCs located in the city of New York. They generally operate on a county-wide basis. ILCs receive partial funding from the state and are subject to oversight by the Access VR subdivision of the State Department of Education. They have a unique dual role. Within the scope of their geographic jurisdiction, they, one, provide federal, state, and local program guidance and service referrals to members, consumers, and other people with disabilities, and two, advocate for social progress or systems change in both the private and public sectors. Sydney is the first and one of the largest ILCs in the state. Based in Manhattan, its evolution since 1978 reflects some of the fundamental formational challenges of the disability rights movement. Despite its all-embracing and unified-sounding name, the disability rights movement is a coalition of different groups with varying impairments and issues and with different historical and organizational backgrounds. The main pieces of the disability rights coalition are, one, people with sensory impairments, in other words, people who are blind or low vision, and people who are deaf or have reduced hearing. Two, people with mobility impairments, generally people who use crutches or wheelchairs. And three, people with neurological or developmental disabilities of whom the best known are probably people on the autism spectrum. People with sensory impairments have the longest history of self-advocacy and the greatest degree of acceptance in non-disabled society. Blind people have been most successful on this front, as shown, for example, by a tax credit that is available to the blind but not to anyone else with a disability. People with neurological and developmental impairments are the most recent to develop concerted sustained self-advocacy. The term disability rights was coined in the 1960s by people with mobility impairments, and for many years the New York City disability rights movement was dominated by issues faced by the mobility impaired, such as narrow doorways, stairs, and automobile-related questions.
Sydney's early days plainly showed this mobility focus. Most of its leadership consisted of wheelchair users, and it took on mobility-related issues like accessible public transit and polling places and curb cuts. Starting in the mid-90s, the organization began addressing a broader range of issues, eventually including services for people with traumatic brain injuries and the needs of homeless people with disabilities, among others. Sydney produced reports on disability literacy among healthcare providers, on subway platform safety for people with visual impairments, and worked on issues such as taxicab usability for people with sensory restrictions, emergency preparedness problems in city and state agencies, and bringing people with disabilities out of institutions such as nursing homes. Also beginning in the mid-1990s, Sydney expanded its geographic scope into the borough of Queens after the ILC originally set up there collapsed. Spurred in part by the enormous demographic diversity of the population of Queens, Sydney has moved beyond what had once been a largely, though not entirely, white membership and leadership. In 2003, for example, it produced a study on barriers to vocational rehabilitation for Asian Americans with disabilities, which led to system changes in language policies and related procedures. Today, 75% of Sydney's consumers and staff are minorities and people of color. DHNYC recently sat down with Sydney's executive director, Susan Duha, who is retiring after more than 20 years. We reviewed a litany of important policy changes that were affected through lobbying, organizing, and litigation. But when asked what accomplishments she was most proud of, Susan immediately cited this widened demographic and disability focus. Sydney has attracted and continues to attract a great many talented individuals. Some of its better known luminaries include Susan Shear, Frida Zames, Ann Emmerman, Harolyn Russo, and Marilyn Saviola. <laughs>